Mongolia, a land between sky, steppes, and deserts. Extreme, exotic, and mostly undiscovered. Home to nomads, ringers, eagle hunters, and horsemen. A land of adventure. A world of both faith and legend that is slowly awakening and beginning to remove its secret veil. Ulaanbaatar, capital of Mongolia. Suhpatarin Talbai is situated in the center of the city, a large square that is flanked by government buildings, an opera house, and various commercial enterprises. This metropolis, set amid the steppes, is the pulsating heart of the country. It combines the cultures of old with a lively feeling of moving towards new horizons. This once socialist metropolis changes from day to day, as does the lifestyle of its inhabitants. From the parliament building, Genghis Khan watches over his people, who are now adapting themselves to modern times. The National Museum contains Mongolia's history. In 1779, the country's religious leader settled here. The spiritual center of Mongolia once lay directly on the peaking Irkutsk trading route. At that time, the city was called Urgu, and life was determined by the region's monasteries and lamas. The Bod Khan Museum is situated close to the river Tuol. Seven temples and a single-story timber-built building of Russian design. The Winter Palace was built for the Bog Khan in 1912, the year when Mongolia gained its independence from China. Then the Bog Gagin, the most revered person in Mongolia, became transformed into the Bog Khan, who was then both the country's spiritual and worldly leader. The throne hall, as well as the other rooms, feature the palace's original furniture and also several gifts from numerous monarchs. From here, the country was ruled with Russian assistance until the declaration of the People's Republic. Zanbazar Museum contains a number of works of the Enlightened One. At the age of five, he became head of the Mongolian Buddhists. And in Tibet, he was a student of both the Panchen Lama and the Dalai Lama. Finally, he became the first Bodgagin, Buddhist dignitaries who were head of their country for 300 years. Under Zanbazar's leadership, Mongolia's first monasteries were built, although the largest was constructed in 1838, the Gandan Hid. The architecture of the temple complex indicates the Tibetan roots of Mongolian Buddhism. Both young and old lamas wear colorful clothes. Ganden Hid is a pilgrimage destination for the faithful from all over Mongolia. They pray and wind prayer mills and crowd into the main sanctuary. In the monastery's main temple is a 26-meter-high statue, the Buddha of Mercy, patron saint of Mongolia. It weighs 20 tons and is decorated with gold and gems. A classical building contains the Natural History Museum. Particularly well-known are a number of exhibits that date back to primeval times dinosaur skeletons and petrified eggs from the Gobi Desert. Today, the outlying districts of Ulaanbaatar are inhabited by rural people who live in circular tents. These Gair districts have no water supply, proper drainage systems or electricity. Indeed, the Mongolian nomad has no need of these services. Here, freedom is the most prized possession. 
This, the only true city in Mongolia, is expanding rapidly. Each day, more young families settle here. This modern city is currently experiencing a building boom. Structures of steel, concrete and glass have emerged here since 1990. Each plot of land is in use. And there's increasing traffic. New restaurants, internet cafes and shops open from week to week. Rapid growth seems unstoppable. And Ulaanbaatar is becoming UB. Construction work is everywhere. The face of the city is constantly changing. The young are beginning to follow Western fashion trends and culture. Commercial life is growing from strength to strength and those with money can shop till they drop. There are also highly visible contrasts. Modern skyscrapers next to gear shops on wheels. In the center of Ulaanbaatar, the Monastery Museum of Shoshin Lamin Hid opens its doors for courageous visitors. This splendid building was constructed in 1904. The unique monastery complex was built for the younger brother of Mongolia's last monarch. Choi Shin was a member of the Tantric school, a Buddhist doctrine. He was highly influential due to his magical powers. Here, ceremonies were practiced from which the normal faithful were banned. The river landscape outside the city gates is in strong contrast to the bad air and hubbub of the nearby metropolis. Prayer banners and colorful cloth in the trees indicate a holy place. Here, people collect health-giving berries from wild bushes. Evocations take place in various ceremonial locations. The shaman gets in contact with the spirits of the faithful. Trance dance and drum beats help him to release his soul from his body. Music, dance and song have always been the main features of Mongolian culture. And since 2002, this show theatre has presented The Moonstone. More than 90 young artists perform in this splendid review with breathtaking traditional music and dance. The Mongolian long song, religious songs, traditional instrumentation, the unique horse-headed fiddle and throat chanting, it has the lot. The choreography of the Mongolian soul features wild temperament, deep passion and boundless enthusiasm. This has been an amazing visit to an exotic and little-known world. And this capital city, with all its incredible contrasts, seems almost unreal. But Ulaanbaatar is very much here, now, and heading for the future. Almost 50 kilometers east of Ulaanbaatar is a leisure area for the inhabitants of the city. The Terech National Park. Riding, cross-country and without limit. Amid splendid and protected nature, Mongolians can do what Mongolians do best. Huge rocks with strange names and splendid river meadows welcome those who come to one of the many Jair camps.
Here, relaxation is the order of the day, with climbing, hiking, riding, and even open-air billiards. Everywhere, sheep and goats pasture peacefully and remain unfazed by tourist buses and cars and enjoy running across the meadows. On the slopes at the end of the valley is a small Buddhist monastery set in picturesque surroundings. The journey to the top is well worth it. The monastery was built for the wedding of a grandson of Tushit Khan to the sixth princess of King Emperor Kangxi. It lies in a scenic location with a wonderful view across the valley. On the eastern edge of Ulaanbaatar, within the spacious plains of the river Tuol, there is a special tourist attraction. The extravagant Hotel Mongolia. This huge hotel complex resembles an old Buddhist monastery complex with a gear section and a central temple restaurant. For those who come here, it's like being in another world. Beyond the huge walls of the temple city, is a large circular tent on a movable pedestal. The leaders of the Mongolian tribes once traveled in such tents. The Nadam is performed and explained to tourists who have traveled here from around the world. Nadam is the most important festival in Mongolia. The roots of this competition date back to the time of the ancient Turks and Hun. Genghis Khan developed contests for his warriors from its traditions. Horse racing, archery and wrestling. The reenacted Nadam festival is opened with spirited dancing. <laughs> Virtuoso throat singers and horse-headed fiddlers set the contestants in the right mood. And a typical snake woman performs amazing acrobatic contortions. Finally, wrestlers make ritual circles around their seconds. The game is on. They begin to wrestle. Weight categories are unknown here. Anyone can fight anyone. The one to land on the ground first with any other part of the body but their hands and feet is the loser. The winner presents himself proudly to the admiring crowd. After horse racing and archery, masked dancers complete the festival, led by the old white man who symbolizes happiness and a long life. And the horse-headed fiddle accompanies the dancers who wear animal head masks. A fine finale for a festival that reflects the gritty character of the country. Wild, demanding and tough. To the south of the city, there's another fine leisure area. The Bod Ul Nature Reserve is located at the end of a blossom-covered valley. Hiking paths are ideal for a stroll, and mysterious columns indicate those whose final resting place is here. And everywhere, flowers and green vegetation. 
On the mountain slope at the end of the valley are the ruins of the Manzushia Hid Monastery that was founded in 1733. An historic place. Traces of the Turkish hordes were discovered here. And it's also believed that Genghis Khan once had his headquarters within this sheltered valley. Galdan, leader of the West Mongolians, is said to have lost a battle against the Chinese Emperor Kangxi here. A turning point in Mongolian history. Today, only paintings, a Buddha, and an image of the Dalai Lama indicate religious faith. Around 100 kilometers southwest of Ulaanbaatar is the Hustain National Park. The only surviving primeval horse breed in the world has found a new home in this harsh region. The Tachis, or Pezavalski horse. Nikolai Pezavalski discovered the last remaining horses of this breed that had been hunted nearly to extinction. They were bred successfully in zoos, so in 1990 they were removed from their natural habitat in the wild. This remote mountain landscape also hides numerous stone monuments and tombs of the Turks who once came to this region. There are also stags, wolves and marmots. In a southerly direction, our journey leads through endless steps, made up roads a few and far between. The mountain region of Konyo Khan Ul, that is one of the Bulgan Aymag districts, contains the most remarkable scenery. Well sheltered at the foot of the mountains is a small temple that also provides information. Several small stupas extend across the slope and indicate a holy place where once religious life took place. The broken walls of the monastery ruins are a reminder of the hostilities that once took place between the army of Zunga Galdan Bochichtu and the monks of Zanbazar in the 17th century. The monastery was destroyed and all of its monks killed. This mystical landscape was well chosen by the monks a tranquil and remote place, ideal for meditation. Mongolia, with its extensive steppes, mountains and desert areas, has always been a land of the nomad. A race of herdsmen and horsemen, proud of their traditions. This untouched and spacious natural landscape with its grazing animals is a wonderful sight. High in the sky circles a bird of prey in search of a tasty dinner. While visitors to the steppe are taken to a camp in which they can relax after an exciting day. Air camps have been constructed specially for tourists. There are no buildings here, only circular tents that are surrounded by a fence. Gurs are mobile tents that are also used by the nomads. They are erected in the spring and taken down in the autumn. Instead of a metal lock, the wooden doors are closed by rope. 
sheep's wool hangs above a wooden framework. And in the middle is a small oven with an outlet at the top of the tent. When the weather's stormy, the roof of the tent is fixed with rope. And as soon as the fire has been lit, it soon becomes warm in the gear. A Mongolian treat. Night is about to begin. Early in the morning, the journey continues, past large herds, and within something that is becoming increasingly rare in most countries, space, and lots of it. Our journey continues in a southerly direction across the steppes, no roads here, with nomads, storms, and whirlwinds for company. Mongolians must stop at each ovu and walk around the pile of stones three times, thereby restoring inner peace. In Khachorin, former residents of those who once ruled Mongolia, today uh, there is little left to see. However, a few mysterious sites remain, which along with the Adenizu Monastery are highly evocative of this ancient city in central Mongolia. For 32 years, this was the center of one of the most powerful empires on earth. Everything was controlled from here. Of their former glory, almost nothing has survived. Only the Adenizu Monastery, which, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, became active once again. By command of the Khalkh Prince Abtakh Khan, in 1586, a monastery was built among the ruins of Mongolia's capital city. Adenizu was the first large monastery in what is today's Mongolia and was for some centuries an important center of Buddhism. Up until 1938, over 60 individual buildings that housed 1,500 devout lamas stood on these monastery grounds. Walls and towers of the monastery made it a veritable fortress. However, in the 17th century, its defenses were put to the test. Conversion of the Khalkha Mongolians to the yellow belief of the Tibetans brought about much serious unrest. In the course of armed conflict with the occupying forces of Manchuria, the complex was badly damaged but later rebuilt. A gentle breath of mystique and melancholy blows over the surviving ruins of this former cosmopolitan city, in which even at that time, and as decreed by law, multicultural tolerance predominated. Close by, huge artificial stone formations appear from nowhere. Kha Bulgas, the Black Ruins. Here, banks of the once 12 meter high surrounding walls, which consisted of unburned mud bricks. In the 8th century, this was the center of the Ugarin realm, long before the Kitan or Genghis Khan settled here. Close to Korgorin are the tomb columns of Hosho Tsedam, sacred places of the Turks who were once here. Lord Kul Tegin is worshipped here, and the Orkon runes on the columns indicate the first Mongolian scripture. We visit another camp. 
This one is on a hill slope with a view across the Karkorin plains. Food is being prepared. The staple diet of the Mongolians is meat. There's always plenty to go around as each nomad family possesses livestock. There are hardly any vegetables apart from potatoes. Mongolian cuisine is dominated by meat. The daily life of the nomads is exhausting. There's much work to do and everyone must join in, including both young and old alike. The duties are distributed in fine detail. Milking is the lifetime work of the women, performed in an open space. The men tend to their large herds of goats, sheep, cattle and yaks. They drive them to the pastures on horseback. The robust yaks are the most famous animals in Mongolia and are used as important beasts of burden. Plus, they provide both milk and meat. Of course, there's also a chef. The head of the family surveys, controls and disposes, always accompanied by his dog. The horse is the Mongolians' most prized possession. Riding is in their blood. On our travels further south, we stop at the Shankhid Monastery. Today, a place of silence and isolation. Once known as Barun Kuri, or the Western Monastery, it's believed that this monastery was also founded by Zanbazar. In 1921, it comprised 20 buildings that accommodated around 1,500 monks. A fact difficult to believe today. As in the rest of Mongolia, in 1937, this monastery was closed. Most of the temples burned down and many of the monks taken to Siberia. Today, the monastery is active once again and young monks greet the day with a time-honored ritual and walk to the main temple for prayer. The temple that dates back to the 18th century and has survived together with a number of storehouses that were restored in 1990. Faith was stronger than political doctrine. Religion won the day. The Orkhon River Valley is one of the most important cultural landscapes in Mongolia. The river sparkles in the sunlight as it winds its way across the green landscape that owes its fertility to the meandering water. It's a place of great historical significance. Orkhon Valley is situated amid the Changai Mountains, birthplace of the Mongolian nation. And the capital city of Karkorin was located here. The most recent discoveries of prehistoric remains are helping to reveal the history of this extraordinary natural landscape. Ancient markings in the steep and almost inaccessible rock walls of a river have been discovered here by nomads. The 
Orkhon is a river of legend. On the upper section of the river, many important historic events have taken place. The gentle flowing water has always followed the turbulent history of this region. And it was the river that was the reason why people settled here. The river valley often changes in appearance. Close to the valley entrance, the young river tumbles down into a pool below. The importance of the Orkhon Valley in the history of Middle Asia is beyond question. A colourful, historical, archaeological and cultural legacy. In the north of the Orkhon Valley, on a remote hilltop of the Kangai Nuru National Park, is an old and famous monastery. To Konyehid. In 1653, the remarkable religious and political deity Undur Gagin Zanbazar came here. The monastery that was built here has always been a place of tranquility and prayer. As in all Buddhist monasteries, daybreak is greeted ceremoniously. Here, young monks blow into shells and turn towards all four points of the compass. The monks enter the assembly hall for their daily prayers. A century-old ritual. small temples were built, each with its own function, such as the Semshin temple that was a summer residence for senior religious guests. And the Lavrin temple that was built in the 18th century at the command of Lusan Guadiaha, head of the Erdinizu monastery. The complex nestles on a narrow mountain plateau. The landscape around the monastery is well sheltered. And a cave above the monastery is believed to be the place where Zanbazar came to meditate. The monks who live in this rocky area must be fit. It's a steep climb to the rocky summit beyond the monastery. They come to worship local deities and spirits. We reach the middle Gobi. The steppe changes to desert. Within this undulating landscape are the ruins of Ongian Hid. Two monasteries were united here, Balim Hid and Khutat Hid. Many artifacts highlighted bygone times. Since the political transformation of the country, Buddhism has returned and the first temples have been rebuilt by young monks. Although this location with its sandy ground and crumbling walls resembles an ancient excavation site, faith still lives on and has found a new home here. Bayanzaya is typical of the Gobi Desert. Here, life is possible. The waterholes never dry out completely.
Yet the Gobi is not what one may think of as a normal desert and is better described as a semi-desert. Or to be more precise, a desert savanna. The Bayanzag features the Sahul, a bush that is resistant to salt. Very useful for the stabilization of the soil and as protection against the wind. The climate of the Gobi Desert is extreme. In daytime, the temperature can be scorching hot and at night, very cold. But both animal and plant life have adapted to the climate. Cold, dry winters are particularly challenging and the herds must be well protected. In the middle of the Gobi Desert is a unique and spectacular natural landscape, Gal Shalu. Here a hint of the geological evolution of our planet is visible. A remarkable region of prehistoric dimensions. Sixty million years ago, dinosaurs inhabited the Gobi Desert. For hundreds of years, scientists have been on the trail of the dinosaur. Thus, excavations have been made around the world that have led to the discovery of many fossilized remains. The flaming cliffs of Gal Shilu are an evocative, primeval scene. A seemingly endless expanse that reveals great geological transformation. It was here that most saurian skeletons have been discovered, along with entire nests that were either excavated from the land or found in various sandstone cliffs. Amazing, impressive and full of surprises. Dinosaurs were most likely killed by the increasingly cold climate. Following millions of years of mild weather, the Earth's climate dropped severely. Climate change took its toll. A fact witnessed by the flaming cliffs of Gal Shulu. The huge Hongorin Els sand dune that is situated in a long valley between two mountain ranges also forms part of this natural landscape. But only 3% of the Gobi Desert contains sand dunes and they are spread across the desert. The Gobi Desert is a unique landscape of rock, stone and sand. This, the fifth largest desert on earth, extends from southern Mongolia to northern China. Here, camels have become domesticated. They're bred from wild camels that are to be found in small, well-protected herds. Located in front of the 120 kilometer long sand dune, the green belt looks like a Fata Morgana. A small Hongor watercourse nourishes both flora and fauna. Here, the Gobi Desert is alive. Narrow as well as wide valleys with watercourses are common. A miracle of nature. The Gobi Desert is inhabited by nomads and their girls. Goats and horse always accompany them.
life in this extremely rocky landscape is very hard. A cold northwesterly wind blows constantly. The dry ground is covered with pebble, loess, and sand. The Italian Marco Polo was the first European to travel through this region. The female horses are milked. Mare milk is a popular drink. A gear is quickly erected. Wooden battens are joined together and covered with felt. And now the comfortable home is ready. Mongolian hospitality is well known. Everyone is welcome. Homemade cheese and the famous Arak are part of every welcoming ceremony, as well as a look at the family album. Up to 600 times the milk is stamped before it becomes Arak, and during the work there's lots of local gossip. During each visit, small gifts are exchanged, and we're invited to come again. The Gobi Desert also contains canyons. One of the most famous is the Yolan Am Vulture Canyon. The first section can be covered on horseback, but as it narrows, it's only possible to proceed on foot. A small mountain river flows between the narrow breach in the rocks and huge stones until the canyon opens up once again. Even in summer, the sunlight cannot penetrate here, and in winter, it is freezing cold. Ice barricades the canyon. Amazing, ice within a desert. This region is now protected due to the value placed on the splendid natural environment that is to be found here. A legacy of our planet that is certainly worthy of conservation. Occasionally, we encounter sacred piles of stone and scattered around them, bones left by the local vultures. The Gobi Desert once contained dense vegetation, as evidenced here in the rocky canyons and small streams. A paradise for vultures. The first flat dwellings in the flat steppe of the Gobi Desert appear. Sandy streets, timber fences, behind them small buildings and a pool table. This is typical of life on the edge of the small capital of the Omnagov Aina, Dalan Zadat. This desert town, close to the Chinese border, has for many years been one of the most prosperous towns of the region. It's a gateway between China and Mongolia. There are several shops, banks, telephone companies, a main street and administrative buildings that have been built according to the typical Russian design. Dalanzadad was once a trading post for Kashmir wool and also a meeting place for the nomads. And several historic events have taken place here. In the large stadium, wrestling matches are held and a monument of a famous wrestler indicates who are regarded as Mongolia's superstars. Our final destination can only be reached by plane. It's the country's most northwesterly region. We take a short stop to fill up with petrol, 
Then the plane follows the course of the Mongolian Altai. Ulgai is the capital of the Bayan Ulgai Aymar district, the westernmost region of Mongolia, bordered by Russia and China. In 1940, this Aymar was founded for the Kazakhs, an ethnic minority who were descended from Turkish Mongolian tribes. In the 19th century, Islam became the main religion here, although shamanism and the ancestral worship are still common. In contrast to the landscape around the city, its few streets contain a few motor vehicles and even a traffic light. It's almost urban. Daily life in the city differs from rural life. The buildings are bigger and more striking. And there's even a Mongolian type Russia. Although the typical Russian building style of the official buildings is obvious, the city has established its own independent way of expressing itself. Discos and clubs are very popular with the young, and the main square is also a regular meeting place. The landscapes of the Mongolian Altai are varied and quite unique. Rivers across fertile pastures and Mongolian steppes, all framed by a majestic mountain world. The inhabitants are still nomads and live amid the remote landscape with their animals, either in small mud huts or traditional gur tents. At first sight, life here appears to be somewhat humble. There's no electricity and water for cooking and washing is supplied by the river. In the morning, the people wash outside, and at night, the Altai is extremely cold. The grassland is known as the birthplace of the nomads, because in former times, ancient Chinese nomads lived here, along with herds of wild yak that have since become extinct due to overhunting. Neighbors are mostly related. They often live within a visible distance of their relatives, although that can be quite some distance. They make their living from their herds of sheep, goats, cattle and horses. The hospitality of the nomads is well known. They share everything they have and enjoy sitting together in a warm tent. A few household implements are neatly arranged and following a meal, salted milk tea is served. The head of the family gets dressed for his daily labors and adjusts his equipment for a famous Kazakhan occupation. The women clean the gear and the dishes. Here the dishwater never sees washing up liquid, so it can be given to the dogs together with the rest of their feed. For centuries the Kazakhs have been eagle hunters. Even today they go hunting just like their ancestors. Birds of prey with which they hunt are golden eagles that have a wingspan of more than two meters and are often awarded prizes. Mm -hmm. 
The spacious landscape is an ideal hunting ground for the female eagles that weigh up to seven kilograms and are able to kill young wolves. They make circles in the sky, study the landscape, then suddenly plunge down onto their prey at a speed of more than 200 kilometers per hour. The birds work hard at their task, for which the men are thankful, and the loyal hunters are always given a tasty reward by their masters. At seven to eight years of age, before reaching sexual maturity, the eagles are released. Then, they must hunt for themselves. Fascinating landscapes and endless plains. This land of blue skies displays all of its splendor. The magic of Mongolia can be felt by all who come here. This journey across a harsh and contrasting land has been an unforgettable adventure beyond compare.